a distinct honor to welcome Carl to speak to before us. Carl really doesn't need an introduction. And he actually came up to me and he said, you're really not going to spend 15 minutes on this, are you? And I, I guarantee him, I said, no, I'm not going to spend 15 minutes on this, right? Because in, some, in many respects, he doesn't have to have an introduction. That's why we're all here. Carl's background is well known to all of us uh, from his accomplishment of, of actually, it's interesting, I read his bio, just like get ready for this, right? It, it actually said create. Is it create or was it, or, or was it defined? Create. It really was create. Okay, so it's, it's create the, the Bose-Einstein condensate, thing, which is quite amazing. And we all know for that that Carl received the Nobel Prize. But after that amazing accomplishment, Carl has also gone on and done some other amazing accomplishments, like as far as really trying to promote and change how science education is done in our nation at the higher end level, which is quite an accomplishment. Now, I met Carl 12 years ago. And if I, I, you know, obviously, you go to his office, what are you going to feel like, right? I'm walking into his office. And what I found really interesting is here is, is this amazing physicist, and he's curious, curious about professional learning and simulations. He's asked me all sorts of questions about, well, how do you prepare people for this? How do you design this? And I, I found that, like, amazing. And then you stop and you think, is it really amazing? And in fact, that's what we're that's why we're all here today. We're trying to do what Carl was Carl was like in that office with me, a curious person, being a curious learner, trying to learn things that we don't know about. And that's what we're trying to prepare all our students students to be, are these curious learners. To, to realize that the world out there is an unknown and it's something for us to discover. And that that's what Carl's done his whole life. And that's his behavior that he always portrays, or is, actually it's not portrayed because he is, is this person trying to learn about the, own, the unknown. So it's my pleasure to have Carl. I'm actually really surprised that he really is here. It's quite an honor actually to have you here on campus. So thank you for coming. Okay, well thank you. It's good to be back here. I've been to MSU several times over the years, but it's been a few years now. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about the scientific approach to really teaching, learning uh, science, but actually that's just because there doesn't fit on the screen to say, this really applies to all the STEM disciplines and almost certainly actually to, to most disciplines as I'll sort of talk about. And I wanna stress, so there's no confusion, I mean, uh, I'm really summarizing a field, so I've done a little bit of work in, you know, few publications, but there's, you know, this is the work of many other people, and in fact, quite a number of, of science, engineering, education researchers here at MSU have contributed to this. Now, I, I want to make a slight correction to the, in the introduction, when uh, Joe, like many people, say, well, I got Bose-Einstein condensation, and then I got a Nobel Prize, and then I started working on, you know, science education stuff. The, the reality is, now I started working on science education stuff way before that. It's just nobody paid any attention to it. <laughs> after that, you know, so, in fact, so a little history is, um, how did I get into this? Well, I, you know, spent many years teaching, sort of standard way. I kind of knew it wasn't really very effective lecturing to these students, but I looked at all my colleagues and they weren't doing any better. So uh, it, you know, it seemed like this was just an inevitable fact of life that uh, what was happening, kind of like the weather, you just I don't have to like it, but you're not going to change it. But what really led me to see this differently was I was actually working with all my graduate students in my atomic research program, and a couple of funny things I saw there. First, they you know, they've been spent all these years doing wonderfully in all these math and science courses before they got to work in my lab. But once they got into the lab, in spite of that, they really were pretty clueless about how to actually do physics. Uh, but even more surprising, after just a couple of years working in the lab, they had turned into expert physicists. And after I saw this happening over and over with enough students, and particularly puzzling was the fact that the ones who'd done the best in their courses and exams 
never turned out to be the, the top physicist in the group. I decided there was a basic problem here, and I started, it was about 25 years ago, and I said, okay, I'm going to go and try and figure this out. And so I took it like a science problem, dug into what the research was on learning, particularly the research on learning physics, and I realized, discovered, yeah, there was a bunch of work out there. Um, and this work could, you know, basically explain the puzzle, gave me a different way to think about teaching and learning, and it actually got me started doing physics education research and then more science education research more broadly. And so for many years I had these, you know, two parallel research groups going on, one in blasting atoms with lasers and then one studying thinking and learning. And so, you know, I'm going to sort of summarize what I learned from this experience. Um, and you know, this is really a very opportune time to be thinking this way because um, over the past couple of decades, there have been major advances in three different fields that are, have now really come together to give us a much clearer picture about uh, what's involved in learning to do complex thinking. And you know, first there's the, the cognitive psychologists who study basics of how pe the mind works, how people think and learn. Uh, now brain research is coming and connecting up with that. And then there's the, the work uh, in the university classrooms. Uh, almost all of it is science and engineering. There's starting to be a little bit now in, uh, in social sciences. Uh, and I, and bas but basically all of these results are all coming together to show you, uh, you know, better ways to learn and teach. And although we don't have this from all classrooms, I think if you look at the underlying principles we get from this part, you can be pretty confident, or very, I'm very confident, that this really would apply to any academic discipline, uh, these fundamental uh, improvements in teaching. So before I, I get into you know, how to teach and learn, I want to say, make sure we have on the same page as what the goal is of the teaching and learning. And what I would argue, and I think most here would agree with me, that the, the basic science uh, education goal, first, I don't want to turn them all into scientists and engineers. Many of the students in our courses, that's not appropriate. Uh, the world couldn't use that many. Um, but it's really to have them, whatever level of course they're in, uh, is to have that help improve um, how they can learn to make uh, you know, better decisions in relevant areas. Uh, and, you know, that's very different from memorizing a whole bunch of facts and procedures and vocabulary that might do great on the on a course exam. It's really not very good for much else. We want them to go out there in the world and make better decisions. And those better decisions in the, in the relevant field really involve using the knowledge and the reasoning processes and standards of an expert, you know, uh, in that field. And so, you know, I really summarize this, I want to think more like experts. So, in the rest of my talk, I'm going to start with digging into what it really means to think like a scientist slash generally expert. How is this learned? And those are kind of cognitive psychology parts of the talk. And then I'm going to show you what happens when you apply these, I, these principles of learning in science education, engineering education classrooms, and measure the results. And then if there's time and interest, I can say a little bit about institutional change. So kind of psychologists have done lots of studies on uh, expert thinking. And they looked you know, across the you know, musicians, chess players, scientists, doctors, etc. And it's very interesting that they found there's certain very a few consistent basic components that make up expert thinking, and there's a consistent process by which one acquires that expertise. So what are these expert components? Well, the first one everyone could guess. Experts in every field have a whole bunch of knowledge about that subject. But the others are, are not so obvious and really important for teaching. Um, first, in every discipline, experts have a have unique to that discipline an organizational framework by which they organize all that knowledge and this organizational structure is key 
to, for them to be able to retrieve and apply that knowledge in useful ways when solving problems. And so, you know, these organizational structures involve, you know, recognizing certain kinds of complex uh, real patterns and relationships. And what we think about as scientific concepts is just the way scientists in a field have taken a whole bunch of different pieces of information and seen how they can, how can they can clump it all together. Technical term is chunking. Uh, <laughs> chunk it all together, and so that when faced with a new problem, it makes it very easy for them to decide, oh, this body of information is going to be useful to me, or no, that's irrelevant to this problem. And so along with the, along with the organizational structure, the bins, or compartments like concepts, are these very uh, detailed criteria that they use for deciding when, uh, when those apply. Then the third component of expert thinking is the ability to, to monitor one's own thinking and learning. So as working through a problem, an expert you know, is regularly asking themselves, do I understand this? Is this a sensible way to be solving this problem? And then they change what they're doing accordingly. Now, the, the research shows that these, these components of expert thinking Nobody comes by these things automatically. They're fundamentally new ways of thinking, and that everyone requires many hours of intense practice to actually develop these capabilities. And quite recently, it's becoming clear that this is this many hours of practice that everybody seems to use is a basic biological requirement, actually. That the process of developing this expertise really involves substantial rewiring the brain. You've been in new neurons, you hook up neurons in very different ways inside, and that this expertise really lies in this rewired brain. And it just takes that much time for people and that much strenuous effort to make the brain go through the sufficient uh, rewiring process. And so, in fact, um, you know, the essentially is extremely close analogy, maybe somewhat, I don't know what's closer than analogy, but to building up a muscle. If you want to build up a muscle, you got to use that muscle, you got to use it strenuously, and you got to do that over a long period of time, and in response, the body says, okay, it's going to keep using that, I got to make it stronger, bigger and stronger, and it does, and it does very much the same with the connections in the brain. So, that uh, oh, I, I should say for the students in the room, um, I said many hours of intense practice. The bad news is if you want to get to sort of, you know, MSU faculty level of expertise, it's many thousands of hours, actually. So, that's, uh, so but what goes into those many thousands of hours, it's also quite uh, important what that is. First, it's got to be things that are exercising the brain in the right way, so it's got to be strenuous, not impossible, but hard, and it's got to be practicing the, the very specific thinking capabilities of expertise in that domain, uh, in that practice. And then finally, so the practice in the specific thinking skills, and then there has to be feedback, and so, uh, you know, guidance on what learners doing right, and then feedback on how to, what they're doing wrong, and how to improve that. And so, it, what, learning to be an expert basically comes down to going through this, you know, cycle over and over and over again, and, and improve, getting higher and higher and higher, and more and more challenging problems. Now, that's really general. Let me try and get a little bit more specific, and some of the kind of specific thinking capabilities you want to you, you need to practice that are I'll pick ones generic to all fields of science and engineering um, first everybody everyone has a, a set of or every field has a set of concepts and mental models and very sophisticated selection criteria about when those do and don't apply so that's one one aspect that has to be something that's practiced identity developing, identifying, and using those conceptual models. Uh, there's very discipline, every discipline has quite specific ways of checking an answer, if it makes sense, uh, you know, there might be a better way to do this. Uh, 
or one has specialized ways to represent information and experts can fluently go between those different representations and in the process get new insights about how to solve the problem. So, you know, I could go on for a bunch more, but this gives you a general sense of the kind of components that go into this, and these have to be the kind of things that the learners are, are practicing. Now, you'll notice I didn't say anything about any specific topic, and if you've been like me, virtually every discussion of curriculum and education I've been at, it's all about, well, do we want to have topic A first or topic B, and do we want to include topic C or not, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, that's a completely different conversation here. And I want to stress that, you know, the knowledge in the field, the topics, they are important. But we have lots of research findings showing that people can learn specific pieces of information, they can do tests showing they've learned them all, but then you give them any real problem and this knowledge is, what we talk about, is disembodied. It just lives out there where there's not an exam. They just don't know how and when to call on it. So it's useless. And so it really is only when this knowledge is incorporated with these kind of more basic elements of thinking that, that allow the learner to know when and how to use that knowledge. That's really ne what's necessary for a good education. Um, so that's what's got to happen in the learner's brain. What is the role of an effective teacher in this process? Well, the teacher has to be thinking about designing the suitable practice tasks at the right level and, uh, and incorporating the right thinking involved, providing the timely guiding feedback to actually help the students improve, and then motivating the students to put in what has to be inherently hard work uh, or they won't be learning, motivating them to see why it's valuable to actually do that. Now, if you actually think about those things, that's exactly what a, an athletic coach does, right? So I sort of think, well, a good teacher is really the cognitive equivalent to a good athletic coach. Uh, and I will also stress that if you think about what's involved in these, um, they really call on the, you know, the expertise of the instructor. They have to know what expert thinking is and they've got to recognize when it's being done or not done. And so I sort of see ultimately this is really the only uh, real rationale for the uh, research university like MSU where you bring together expert faculty or experts in the subject and they're supposed to be teaching it. Uh, okay, so before I go into talking about how to apply this in the classroom, I want to say a little bit about uh, what this kind of teaching isn't, because a lot of times when I talk about well, like practice and feedback, or sometimes it's called research-based or active learning, uh, what I mean, I mean by that, some people say, oh, well, that's just you know experiential learning or the flipped classroom or student-centered, and I want to emphasize it's not any of those, okay? Um, these are just kind of formats of what's going on, but they don't say anything about what the cognitive activity students are going to be doing in that format. And what I'm talking about, and so, you know, they may contain them, but they don't, there's nothing necessarily that says they have to, and frequently they don't. Whereas when I'm talking about the, you know, expert thinking and the discipline and that the students are working on those, there's, it has to be front and center of these activities. Um, the other, the other thing is just to, you know, uh, harp on the student, on the student-centered thing. As I say, these are really centered on the learning that takes place, and so there's a, there, there should be, and there has to be a lot of instruct, in, you know, the instructor. I won't say if they're the center, but they're certainly playing a major part in it, in this, in the tasks and the feedback they give, and they should be doing a lot of talking. Uh, but it's talking at the right time when students are prepared to learn from that talking. And I'll say a little bit more about uh, what that preparation is later. Okay, so how would you apply this in a big classroom? I have a feeling with this group, this is going to seem pretty, you know, most of you are going to be pretty familiar with it, but bear with me. Uh, so, um, 
Now, I'm going to take the example of where I think most people think it's the most difficult, namely a class of you know, 250 or 300 students. I'm going to give you a physics example, but there you can find examples from you know, basically any of these other disciplines, people doing very much the same thing, probably mostly, uh, and you can find them on, here on campus. Um, so I'm going to take uh, teaching about basic current voltage introductory students, and so I would start having a, a targeted pre-class reading assignment on the information, and I don't expect them to really learn the physics from this, but it's, they can certainly learn the basic facts and terminology from that, uh, and so I don't have to waste valuable class time telling them that. They can get it better from a book. I give them, we've done some studies on getting how to get students to do this. Turns out you need to give them a short online quiz, a little tiny bit of reward, and they do it consistently. Um, and then class doesn't have to start with me telling them things. I can start with giving them problems and questions. And so uh, in a big class like this, I give them this question about, you know, I've got a battery here and light bulbs, and ask them when they close this switch, what's going to happen to the brightness of that bulb? And every student, individual student has a clicker, and so they go and, you know, press what they thought. Answer was, the computer, my computer records that. Now, I, I've seen a lot of really poor clicker use, particularly since I've been at Stanford, and so I want to say a little bit about what clickers do and don't uh, give you. Um, and, you know, from an instructor's point of view, they can be handy. I wander up here with their voting, I get a quick snapshot of, okay, do lots of know this or not know this, you know, especially if it's a new course, that's helpful. But more importantly is what they do for the students. And I mean, at one level, first, they, it's, they have to cut, you know, commit to an answer at which there is some level of accountability for. And you know, I have a lot of questions I don't grade at all for right and wrong, but you know, they know that I can and will routinely go in and look at what they answered, though, and who they were. And that's enough to make them, OK, they're committing. So that, when people are put in that position, basic psychology says they think about it a whole lot more intently than I just threw the, you know, threw the question out to the class. Uh, and that thinking about it has um, really primes them to learn from the subsequent activities. Um, the first of which is that I don't show them the vote, I don't show them um, what happens, I instead have each adjacent three students discuss what the answer is and what the reasons why, and then they re-vote after that discussion. And while they're doing that, I'm not standing up here waiting, I'm running around the aisles listening in on those conversations. I'm getting little snapshots of what's going on in those students' brains. And so what aspects of, of their thinking are what I want and where they're going wrong in their thinking. Then, after their, that vote's done, then I go ahead and demonstrate what it is, show them, show them the results of the vote sometimes. Um, and then, but more importantly, then I lead a follow-up summary in which I give, they get feedback. So they, on which model, conceptual models they had were right, and which weren't, and which reasoning was correct. And then, most importantly, which reasoning was incorrect and why. And I stress this, um, Partly because the cognitive psychologists have, have convinced me that that's where most of the learning actually takes place. And partly because I see so many Stanford faculty skipping over this and being, oh, 40% of you got it wrong. Here's the right answer, OK? And that's no good to people. People don't learn from that. They learn from understanding what they did wrong and what was incorrect about their reasoning, and then how to change that and improve it to do better. Uh, now, when you're teaching this way, this also leads to, to many more student and better student questions as they expand and elaborate and cover additional material uh, through those questions. So, okay, so how is this having them practice thinking like physicists? Remember, that's what I wanted. Uh, you can see, well, they've got a new situation. They've got to decide, you know, what's relevant in that, in that question, in that situation. They've got to think about what their basic conceptual model is of how electricity works, and they've got to uh, apply it to this system to make predictions. And 
then they have to also be critiquing whether their re answer and whether their fellow students' answers make sense. So all of those things are very much physicist thinking that you, you, you need people to, you want people to learn. And while they're doing that, they're getting timely, specific feedback to help improve their thinking in multiple forms, both you know, from their interaction with their fellow students and what they have to say, looking at how their predictions compared to what the result was, and then mostly the, the feedback they're getting from me, a now highly informed instructor, because I've been listening in to all those conversations. So that's how this kind of teaching is really giving you very directly the practice and feedback. So, okay, so that's the basic idea of how well does this work if you actually you know, try this in a classroom and you compare it with the pervasive lecture model of teaching uh, all these disciplines. And so uh, a few years ago, I counted up how many studies I could find, and it was about a thousand uh, of take, you know, these kind of research-based teaching methods, comparing them with straight lecture and measuring outcomes. Um, and if you really want to go get a massive meta-analysis, all this stuff, you can uh, dig into this paper. But um, what you see is these consistently show greater learning, uh, but I want to stress uh, the kind of learning that they, they make the biggest effect on are the kind of science, you know, expert-like decision-making uh, is where the, the big differences show up. You know, remembering facts and procedures, not so much. Um, they lower, lower failure rates across the board, and they benefit all students, but uh, here the data is not quite as compelling and, and uniform, but they generally benefit the most at-risk students the most. So I'm going to give you a few examples of various class sizes and subjects, sort of showing you what can be obtained. So uh, this is one that I like because it took out many different instructors across many small sections and to had them teach two different ways and compared results. So um, this was the first year physics course at Cal Poly, covers the basic you know, mechanics, concepts of force and motion. Physics education researchers have develop some good tests that look at how well students can, uh, you know, when faced with some novel real-world situation, like cars running into truck, how well they can make a prediction like a physicist would using those concepts to, as to what's going to happen. And so they use that test and collected data across these many sections and instructors for a few years, and they came out with a measure in this test of about 0.3 which turns out to be, we have data on this from many, many introductory physics courses. That's, like, that's typical for a well-taught but traditional lecture course. Uh, then they switch to what they label a studio, but it's basically students are, you know, there's around 40 here, so students are sitting around small tables working together to work through a set of carefully developed problems, and the instructor is wandering around working as a coach or facilitator as they do that. And so using the same test then, the later years after they'd switched, uh, here's the results. It just, the average just doubled and basically everybody went up. In fact, all of the instructors now are within the statistical noise, essentially e equal in the, in the learning dates for the students. So when it, the point I want to stress here is that you've got the same group of instructors and they simply change their teaching methods and all of their students learn better, okay? So, you know, you've got the, the exuberant, uh, you know, excitable theatrical ones, you've got the, the quiet laid back ones, and everybody, students are learning a lot better when they're using the different teaching, better teaching practices. Um, Here's another example. This is from computer science. Uh, Beth Simons is at UCSD. She came and worked with my program for a year, and she basically learned, uh, you know, learned what we, the approach of teaching I just illustrated in the physics example, and went back to UCSD and with the other three instructors who teach the core introductory computer science courses there, applied that teaching method to all of those courses. And what they were measuring is the drop in failure rates. And 
across the board, they went down dramatically. And so um, you now again have a situation in which you've got the same four instructors simply change their teaching methods and now they have about a third uh, failure rate that they used to. So what this means is that UCSD has a, a large number of students who are now successfully able to pursue a major in computer science who simply weren't able to before because the instructors weren't teaching them as effectively. Now, that, those two studies and the vast majority of studies in this field um, are looking at the learning that takes place over an entire course, and that's really what you care about. But that involves a whole lot of learning that takes place outside the classroom, you know, studying, doing homework, setting your exams. And so this was an experiment specifically, you know, just an experiment to look at how much learning happens just in the classroom, do a comparison there. And we also wanted uh, to use this to address the concern that's very often raised is how can you cover as much material? Uh, you, know, with, you know, people say, well, that sounds nice, but I can never cover all the material I have to. So here we have two sections carefully, you know, the same class, carefully measured, the essentially identical whole pile of different tests. And the control section was taught by somebody who was very experienced, had taught this course many times, had high student ratings, but used a traditional lecture. And the experimental section was somebody who was a fairly new PhD, but had gone through my program and training on these principles and implement and methods of research-based teaching. And then the two of them agreed on exactly the set of learning objectives, the material to be covered, and the time to be done in just one week of classes. And it was carefully timed so they wouldn't be studying, doing homework or studying exams during that time. And then they jointly developed an exam targeting these objectives that was given as a surprise quiz right at the start of the next class. So it was really to see, OK, what learning did they take away from those, that, that week of classes uh, from these two uh, approaches? And the, the experimental class design, well, it was just what you saw, you know, targeted readings, clicker questions. And some of these that were more detailed calculational topics covered, and so for those, they were using worksheets where students can write things down, etc. Uh, but everything else was uh, much as I said. So uh, here's here's the, how the students did on this on this common test. Uh, now, with the so this the the score on the test and the number of students here, the histograms. Now, the difference between these the standard lecture and these scientific teaching class is actually larger than you probably would guess looking at this. And the reason is that uh, this was a rather, to keep an objective, this was a carefully developed multiple choice test. And so just by random guessing, the average student would get three. And so what you really have to look at, if you want to look at the amount of learning, it's sort of how far they are above three. I mean, you, you, you realize that. You realize just what a small amount they're learning in the standard lecture and how big the difference is between the two, uh, two, two sections. I, I want to stress a couple of other things. First, you see the clear improvement for the entire distribution. It all moves up, OK? The reason I want to stress that is a lot of times people say, well, maybe this is just better for the weaker students, for the better, you know, the better students. They don't need teaching this way. But this shows and many other people have similar kinds of data. Now, this shows this is just better for the students who have a human brain, because this is the way <laughs> the human brain learns, OK? Uh, we also measured engagement in this. No surprise, in the active learning class, they're much more engaged. They're busy having to solve problems, arguing about answers, et cetera, instead of just sitting there listening to somebody talk. Uh, now, for people who are you know, may haven't done these kind of tests and are still lecturing, uh, they might be kind of stunned at the size of the differences. You know, I wasn't so stunned because I started out this area measuring what my students were learning from my lectures, uh, so I knew it was pretty dismal. But uh, I wanted to stress, this doesn't mean you shouldn't be talking to students, and it doesn't mean there shouldn't be some lecturing of a certain time. And this. This time for telling classic by Schwartz and Bransford is a particularly 
good exam, uh, careful study of this, I recommend to everybody. Um, and they really show how people can learn a lot from, you know, being told things, but only if they're properly prepared for that learning. And so, um, that you know, what they showed is they have the student has to first go through certain activities that, in this study, really develop the fundamental knowledge organization structure. So then, the, when they were at a lecture, they could sort of fit it in with that structure. And in their case, they, they had them develop that structure by analyzing certain contrast, you know, particular carefully selected contrasting cases to make people, to have them focus on key differences that, the differences that, and features that experts look for. And uh, so this is basically just, you know, there are results with different ways that the, and, and I just want to stress, so here's where the students went through the analysis to prepare them, and then after lecture, uh, well, they had to predict the results of a, of a novel experiment they hadn't seen before. Okay, so if you think about this, uh, you know, a, 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 an experiment in, in, a, in a discipline that's different from anything you've seen, this is A, really hard, and B, very much an expert task. You know, experts, this is the thing experts do for a living. And so, so you get 0.6 here versus the ones who really weren't at all prepared for this. And, and so much like the student who first walks in and just hears a lecture uh, you know, beginning, like in many of our subjects, and they're down here pretty close to zero, about uh, you know, 10, uh, 10 times worse. Um, now I want to finish up by um, you know, that's all introductory courses, and the vast majority of this science and engineering education research is really focused on engineering, on introductory courses, and that's led to a lot of people thinking, well, by the time students are more advanced, it doesn't really matter. They seem to do fine in, in lecture courses. And so we and a few other people more recently have been moving up into the upper level and showing, no, this isn't true at all. Uh, and so uh, we've done a bunch of advanced physics courses uh, across both UBC and Stanford. This paper, because it, it sounds technical with the modern optics, but forget the modern optics, uh, you know, in, this is useful if you want to design any course, an advanced course. It goes in, in great deal of detail, the general design and implementation principles and practices, it's, so it's not that specific to the topic. Um, Anyway, okay, so we wanted to measure learning on this. We had some particularly challenging set of questions we could repeat each year. Uh, and so after they really refined the lecture uh, in this course, we are getting around 60. And then after this transformation, it improved, the scores improved by a full standard deviation, which, you know, is a, is a lot if you're worrying about such things. And then another instructor actually took over the materials and taught the, the course, and they even did a little better. So yes, it's the same basic principles uh, work. Uh, at Stanford, just over the last two years, most of the mainstream uh, physics majors courses uh, now, well, after the first year, have been transformed with a bunch of different faculty jumping in to do this, it's kind of pleasant, uh, working together. And uh, we have some learning results, but I won't, those, I won't skip over those mostly, and so just kind of some of the dramatic things the faculty have found here. Uh, the first one that's very striking to all of them is the attendance has gone way up con and is consistently high across all of these courses. They've discovered they can cover as, at least as much and sometimes more material than they were doing when they were lecturing these classes. Um, and the student, we collected student feedback on all these things, and the anonymous comments are just, are overwhelmingly positive, actually, there. And I'm not sure if that's unique to Stanford or just we're figuring out how to do this well, but, uh, but yeah, so most of the students are actually now calling for all their physics courses to be taught this way. Um, there's another point, though, that's really important to make, which is all the faculty have, you know, once they tried this, they all found this very much preferable to 
the lecture that they were doing before. It's just a much more rewarding way to teach. And so none of them will consider, you know, a bunch of them are telling me, yeah, I had to put extra work in this, but you know, no, I've never considered going back to lecturing again. Um, and in fact, uh, these big programs I ran at Colorado and British Columbia on transforming a very large number of courses and faculty, this is the general result that we get across them, that, that essentially none of them are, were, are you know, once we, we push them and prodded them into making into teaching this different way, none of them are going back because they just find, again, it's just a much more rewarding, the students are much more engaged, they're called upon to their disciplinary expertise and use uh, much more. So, okay, so I'm just going to wrap up there with uh, saying about the, uh, a little bit on institutional change, you know, so when you, you know, what you see is better for the students, they learn more, they're happier, uh, and the faculty, when they've actually taken the time and, and effort to, to teach this way, they greatly prefer, so how come there's still a campus full of lectures here and every other campus full of lectures um, going on, and it, and what can you do to change that? Well, I'm not going to go into that here, but I'll refer you to this book that I wrote, which is the, the lessons from those big initiatives, um, you know, about what universities and departments can do to get the widespread adoption of these teaching methods, and uh, the process for, for making that happen. Uh, so I urge you all to run out and read this book. But, you know, we did transform you know, over 200 science faculty and, uh, and at, U, uh, at UBC, and it's about, uh, you know, 150,000 credit hours per year, which is over half the credit hours, well over half the credit hours they offer in science. So that was a pretty uh, major change. It does show you that you really can change entire departments. Um, now, there are a lot of important issues involved in that and things that are critical to make it work. And I'll say, you know, the top two, I think, are first, people just have to realize that teaching um, is really now, with, with this research base and so on, it's an expertise. And it really, you know, per previously it was kind of a folk art. People kind of walked in and did what they felt like, and everybody felt it was kind of equivalent. I sort of see that now, you know, universities are kind of the state where medicine was back in the, you know, 1870s or so, <laughs> or 90s, where you had this scientific basis that really gave people a far better understanding, new insights, and much more effective ways to help with treating disease. But, and so that was wonderful, but at the same time, it was clear that you needed a completely different training. There was now medicine was expertise. You needed completely different training to become a good doctor. And you know, that makes some tension and, and challenges there to make that happen. And I think we're really at that point now uh, in, in teaching. Uh, and not so disconnected from this is the university incentive system that really, um, you know, there, like every place, the incentive system is overwhelmingly based on the uh, research and the student, you know, the teaching evaluation is just student evaluations. That counts very little for probably good reason. And, and so we really, to make these things happen, we had to create an artificial incentive system to counter the official incentive system, which really does penalize people. Um, and so I want to just finish with arguing that really a necessary first step to make any of this, you know, to bring this into the medical equivalent of the 21st century is one has to start with a better evaluation of teaching quality. And I've written this article that goes into a lot of the, the detailed issues involved in this, uh, but I'll just tell you a, a basic requirement, I think, is it needs to, to include measuring what leads to the most learning. Um, it has to be equally valid and fair for use in all courses, so it's not 
a bias by you know gender and class size and all those things. And it's got to be actionable. It's got to show people what to do to improve and then be able to measure if they made those improvements. That's a fundamental feature of any sensible evaluation system. And it's got to be practical to use uh, routinely. Now, by this measure, the student course evaluations basically clearly fail on all but being practical. <laughs> OK, it's easy to use. Um, so the better way, what I would argue, is something that probably you don't want to completely replace, but you certainly want to add in, along with student evaluations, is to characterize the practices that are really being used in teaching uh, a course. And so you can look at to what extent are these people using uh, you know, research-based methods. And so we developed this teaching practices inventory, make it a practical way to collect this information. It takes typically five to 10 minutes for a faculty member to, to fill this out for a course. If you go here, there's a section on it. You can actually plug in there and run the survey for yourself and see where your score is. Um, now, you know, this is a proxy for student learning and success, uh, admittedly. But you know, every measurement is a proxy, and this is a better proxy than what we're using now. Uh, so to, to wrap up here and, and open it for questions and discussion, I uh, want to stress that you know, the meaningful goal of science education is really to have students learn to, you know, learn to be able to make better decisions uh, and choices in the relevant conditions. Uh, the research is really providing with new insights and data on how to do this effectively in our teaching and learning, at, the, at least at the university level. Um, and taking this approach you know, greatly improves the, how the student learning and the faculty enjoyment of teaching. And so uh, with this, I'll leave you. First, I'll make sure the slides are available so you don't have to try and write all this stuff down. I'll give them to Joe and him post them somewhere. Um, you know, my two favorite books here are actually not science specific, but uh, they're sort of relevant to all learning and thinking, particularly at the teaching at the university level uh, up here. And then this the CWSEI website. You know, one thing I didn't really tell you is all these critical implementation details, which again, I mean, they're. They're not trivial. We've done lots of experiments figuring out how to get these things right. We have a whole bunch of, we have some stuff for students, and there are students there about learning, but for faculty, I have a whole bunch of one and two page guides that deal, because uh, I figured that's, that's the extent that faculty are going to be willing to read anything um, um, on very specific implementation issues and, and challenges, uh, ways to, you know, things to avoid. There, so you can might find that useful also. So thank you. Yep. We're supposed to have a half there. Yes. How did you assess the the two hundred plus faculty, whether they truly transformed the teaching or not? Uh, yeah. So the question is, I'm going to be repeating questions so they can get another recording. Uh, how did we assess the teaching? So we were in a, a unique position there that uh, we now know how all courses are taught in science at UBC, which nobody, nobody else at any other place could tell you. And we did it only because we had these, these science education specialists embedded in all the departments. And among other things, they went around monitoring <laughs> uh, what everybody was doing. And we, by the time we had been in, in working on this for a while, we were we could be quite certain that people who who they didn't know as using these kind of methods were still using traditional lectures. So, uh, but but yes, we we were mon we did this kind of follow up monitoring of the faculty and the teaching methods through this network of of people in departments and the annual reports we had departments have to to fill out. Yeah, so part of, um, okay, so I'm going to have to, you know, refer you to the book and the website to go into those details. 
but the the things pe we supported people and gave money and support to do uh, a particular form of course transformation where it had to go through starting with identifying what the student it's sort of three leg legs what the student should learn so that's laying out much better in actionable terms much better learning goals than they previously had developing assessments to target those learning goals and then introducing teaching practices to improve to improve the attainment of those goals and so uh, and so that assessment was really built into the trans the, the change in assessment from sort of very basic level was built into the uh, into the improvement process and and a big part of when we worked with them on workshops on learning goals was okay and how would you assess this they'd work out what would be typical exam questions or homework questions you might have that would allow you to assess that so yes yes i i thought your example between the normal lecture and the scientific lecture and the results was similar but i have a question about the process yeah as i understood what you said you had a multiple choice test yeah that the two classes took at the end of the day uh, the beginning of the next day, actually. But, uh, yeah, but uh, after, just at the end of, yes. Once, once the two, yeah, right, that's right. Two, yeah. Well, uh, right. Students, yeah. Students, right. They took a multiple choice test. Right. And you're concluding that the scientific method was better than the lecture method based on that test. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, what did you do about the initial conditions? You have two population students. It's, it's, yeah. And one way you could mitigate the differences there would be to give them the test first, let them score themselves as a pretest, let them take the month long course, and have them take the test again. What's the yeah. result that you did okay. that way? Well, so, so first, uh, I mean, for this particular thing, we wanted to look at this very short term thing okay. that's going to be, long yeah, long. but short term, it's going to be biased biased by them if they've seen the test before. And so what we did do was, you can go look at the paper, we, ha we have seven different measures of those students showing, we've got midterm scores, we've got attendance, we've got attitudinal scores, uh, you know, so we have seven different and pre-measures. Well, the objective is for the students. No, I, I, no but, but but if you want to have a good measure, uh, this gets too technical after, but if you want to have a good measure of learning and not and, and, and not biased by a test, a week is too short to give a pre-post thing. We do have two midterm scores for those all those students that we can do that where we did the comparison. Okay. But go look at the paper. Yeah, okay. My point. My point I, I, I'm not missing the point. I'm saying if you go read the paper, and you'll understand the answer. <laughs> Is it anybody done a test where they gave them the exact exam first? Yeah. They didn't take the course. They took the course and they took the same exact exam later. So I mean, in 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 most course things studies and certainly in physics and many others, there is a you administer the test on a pre-post basis, and so uh, like the the Cal Poly result I think, is the same test. At the beginning, the same test at the end. Oh, okay. uh, in many of these things, in that particular case, there was a reason not to do it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. So this term things are around a little bit in the, the students how to do some advanced work before coming to the class. That's right. Instead of coming to listen to you and then going home to the class, mm -hmm. right? Right. How long did it take to when we first started to get students to buy? Yeah. So we did experiments on that, and we've gotten that we've written a paper on it. You can see on the CWSEI website under the research papers. But yeah, so we we did a variety of experiments to find out, you know, how to make that work. And basically, what we found is there's three critical components. If you put these in place, what we've seen across a whole range of different kinds of courses and different disciplines, you get about 80 to 85 percent of the students doing the reading, and it's a variable 85 percent any given week. Um, and the three components are: it has to be targeted, so not you know read 50 page chapter seven, read you know these select pages which are going to be relevant to the 
material we're going to be covering in the next two days, okay? And we'll be using that material. So targeted, um, you need to give them some sort of minor, you know, these online quests. It's got to be a little bit of, of grading. It's the funniest thing. I, I well, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I learned from actually these studies and these interviews with students that came out of this is grading is a way that they see that something you tell them that something's important or not. And so if it counts for a grade, even a little tiny bit, you told them, oh, you should spend time on this. It doesn't count for a grade. It doesn't matter what you say. You've given a message. They should do something else and that has a grade attached. So those are the two things. And the third and the most often uh, aired on by faculty is you should never, ever walk into class and say, well, you were supposed to do this reading, but I know that a lot of you didn't, so now I'm going to review what was in the reading. And you've just rewarded everyone who behaved badly and punished everyone who did what you wanted, and nobody's ever going to forget that lesson. Okay. So what you, I mean, you know, I end up doing uh, the way to understand expert thinking is I find you really have to do a so-called cognitive task analysis. Look at what an expert is doing when they're going through a problem in, you know, in a certain, you know, working through a problem in a certain area. And it has to be a real problem. It's not something they've seen a hundred times or just generating following a standard prescription. And but basically, you know, there is a certain step, set of steps, there's a certain reasoning. They all kind of start out, I mean, one of the things that I've identified seems to be quite general is they'll, there'll be some question and they'll come up with a, a multiple possible solutions, you know, that would explain this, where there's not enough information, and then they'll sort of work through what information do they need to, to see, if, you know, to test if those explanations are right. Uh, and so on, and they have certain certain ways of getting information, certain standards for for doing so. So you know, I can't sit up here and I mean, I can I've done this for a few disciplines, and I can sort of go through what's involved uh, in those particular ones. I can't from here. What I can, you know, what I know from experience, I can do is just sit and ha have somebody talk through how they're doing, and I'm looking at particularly every point in which they're making a decision about something, you know, whether it's a decision that, oh, I should worry about this, or no, I can neglect that, or we really need to know more about this, or this connects up with somebody else, this looks similar to somebody else's work. Anyway, all those decision points are places where they're bringing in expert thinking, and, and you can sort of identify those, and then those are the things you you need to map over onto. But it, you know, it does require sitting down and thinking quite a bit about <laughs> how do we think in this discipline and therefore how can we have students think and they're, they're you know, all, all the research and people, the more, you know, people study these things a lot across an enormous range of fields and they always find there's pretty clearly identifiable uh, aspects to it. I mean, in some sense, that's what defines a field, is that people all agree that they would think about certain kinds of problems in similar ways and have similar standards for, for investigation. Here, I'm, I'm being too front heavy here. Let's get a little diversity from the back. Uh, I guess you're close enough to that. <laughs> you're a little farther back. Uh, we got a bunch of money. Departments compete. That's uh, always a good start. Uh, departments could compete for relatively one to two million dollar uh, 
funds, and then they could use that money in a variety of ways. They, a, lot of, the, a lot of that money was used to hire science education specialists within the dis, you know, who PhDs in the discipline who could then work with faculty and help them learn and, and develop, transform these courses. And part of it was used for direct incentives to the faculty, you know, buyouts from a term of teaching, uh, you know, summer salary, things that freed up their time, made it, you know, they could see it was a balance against what they were officially being rewarded for. Again, that's talked a lot about in the book, so, other, yes? Um, so, I, I agree with everything you said, uh, thank you very much, but I wanted to ask you, uh, you didn't talk at all about the structure of the course that's being taught, and um, I think that if we look deeper into a lot of the research that's been done, uh, a lot of these approaches have allowed students to do things that are still relatively trivial and relatively disconnected. And if you go back to um, your, the start of your talk where you were talking about how experts have a different um, coherent contextualized framework of knowledge, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the structure and the, the progression of ideas in the course. Have you, have you uh, all looked at that? Yeah, so I mean, th this idea of kind of looking at the, the structure of the courses, uh, I mean, that is a, a critical issue here. And we strongly encourage people as a, you know, I didn't get in here, but in the transformation process, and, the book it talks a lot more about you know what went into these and so we went into the process of simply having them you know have to identify lay out the learning goals for the course okay and hopefully that would they would look at that and sort of think how to, how these really fit together and, you know in many cases they would go through and realize oh we've been teaching this way and this is these are kind of either these goals or this whole area of topics doesn't really fit in here, we, we can make this better. But frankly, in some cases, um, there are some courses where I was just very frustrated with because it made, you know, they had no, the, the stuff they put in there, some ancient, historical, totally illogical ordering and those courses never worked very well, and you know it didn't matter if you use active learning or not. If you have a, a course that sort of has a crazy enough basic design of what it's going to cover, it, it doesn't work. And and so you know all I can tell you is that usually was was sort of self-correcting, but in some conspicuous cases, uh, this didn't help at all, and that's an issue. You know. We didn't really tackle and didn't really solve, to be honest. Yeah. Can you say that clearly that that is really, when I go back to this article here, uh, the, the best measure of that really went into this course uh, and the transformation of that. And uh, so that's taking, a, that's taking a course that people have been lecturing and then they converted it over, okay? So that, uh, and, and what I found is it took about kind of 50 extra hours. Okay, so that was, you know, that's with support, but that's what they're using. I checked with, you know, we've had a, I've had a bunch of, of Stanford faculty transform there, and they say, yeah, that's sort of consistent with their experience too. Is this kind of extra, extra 50 hours to kind of put, put those things in, and, uh, you know, the great majority of that's in the first year, and it turns out, if you're got the, you know, reasonable support and nowhere to, you know, guidance. You can do most, you get most of that in the first year, and then you do fine-tuning in second year, and so on. Now, you know, 
these these are not dealing with the uh, Melanie problems that she has, where you can have these kind of crazy legacy courses that you know, and department ownership and strong views about what's covered that get into old messy things. But those are fortunately the the exception, not the rule. Yes. So you said that uh, the goal here is not to make a whole bunch of new scientists, of course. Uh, yeah. Um, but you start off by saying, here's how experts think. And right. The 10,000 chunks, and those, that's the idea of the person who right. has become a scientist. Well. Right. And currently, there are two populations that we're training. They're, we're training the ones that we want to go into that and become scientists. Right. But we know that maybe 90% of them aren't, nor would we want them to. Yet the right. the same class. So, seems like those are quite different learning goals that you would have mixed up together. Can you say something about the difference? Between yeah, I, I think I think they aren't different learning goals. It's a reality. I think you need to think about this. Uh, I mean, because the more we know about learning and expertise, the more this is like learning to play the violin. Okay, you start out, and, you know, it's sort of if you if you look at time versus expertise here. You know, it's sort of going up like this, and and you know, if you want somebody who wants to come in and spend a couple of years, you know, learning to play violin at some simple level, and then they're just going to stay happy to stay at that level and play with it. Uh, you know, they're this part of the curve, okay? And if they decide no, they want to become a you know a, a concert violinist, they just have to keep going up the curve. But the nice thing is. It doesn't really seem like these are different curves. It's just farther up the same curve is, uh, is basically what the, the studies on expertise uh, show. Okay. Now, you know, there are certain aspects of the expertise that you may want to stress more or less at different times, but you know, that's sort of not fully straightened out, but it's pretty suggestive from what we're getting in physics, though, that a lot of those basic things you you want them to get right at the very you know even though they're coming going to be advanced physics you know graduate students if they didn't get it right at the, the, some of these conceptual things in their first year they have they still have those things wrong way up there and so you it's it's hard to fix them so you you sort of want those to be right you know and and yet those are also the basic concepts that you want the person who's going to go out and Drive a truck, or, or well, you know, become a biologist, or whatever, <laughs> uh, to, to, to also have. So, <laughs> no, they're just—it's just a widely useful skill. Is the thing I'm trying to, you know, if a truck has to decide between running into the little car or the big car, they'll know to use the little car. <laughs> yes. So the, the answer to the second question is I don't know of examples where they, uh, you know, I'm sorry, computational modeling and thinking uh, in science where people have, have, you know, done these kind of transformations of thinking how to teach that. So I, I can't give you any examples. You know, I see that as just another, as a, a particular aspect of, you know, expert thinking in certain disciplines that's become a, an important component of the expertise. Uh, and should be, in, you know, as appropriate, incorporated in 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 that same way. I don't see it as really fundamentally different in any way. Okay. Uh, you know, it's an enabler of certain things, but you know, a whole bunch of things in science are enablers of other things, and so, uh, I, you know, I think it's it's more novel, and so we have to, you know, it takes more. Arguing with your colleagues about whether the white belongs in the curriculum, than you know something they've been doing for a hundred years, but that's you know that's just basic uh, no, no fundamental uh, differences on it. Yeah. So most of the examples of, of um, 
exercises in class, questions tend to be fairly conceptual or qualitative. I wonder yeah. if you think there's a, a role for more quantitative, not necessarily in terms of calculation, but you know, beyond just conceptual. Yeah. So, so that that's a misleading from what I was just presenting. Okay. So. You know, things with clicker questions that you're giving to 250 students at once, yeah, that works much better to have conceptual. But in all these more advanced classes like this, you know, this modern optics course, all of the Stanford advanced ones, um, they, are, they are, you know, they're working through extensive quantitative calculations, at the, I guess in this picture here. Um, yeah, so. So, you know, here, this is involving, you know, these are advanced physics courses. There's a whole bunch of calculations. Those are set up there with, you know, working through, they say, on worksheets. What they do, are doing, and, and it's really the, the best way to run class, is, you know, you don't want them to spend a whole bunch of time on simply the, the algebraic manipulations in class. You want to have them think about what the, you know, key, important decision points in and how you would formulate the mathematics, how you would deal with some, you know, particular challenging aspects of it. So they work through that. And, you know, some of these you want them to carry all the way through the solution, then you can have them go home and finish that off as a homework problem. But there's a whole bunch of, yeah, these are all predominantly quantitative uh, calculational based, although, you know, in class there's a lot more about justifying why one solution method is better than another and maybe testing them out to, to see and so on that you know that okay is it but but yeah I didn't mean to it's it's only on the kind of big clicker question big class clicker questions where it doesn't work so well doing uh, quantitative things yes way back yes you had noted that we need better ways of characterizing good practices. So yeah. do you have some suggestions for us? Um, be better ways of incentivizing? I or? think characterizing good practices, perhaps, in the last slide, that you had suggested that we go to a website. And I'm just curious what you might suggest, even to us right now. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, the, uh, the second to last slide. I apologize. Oh. One last, sorry. Uh, yes, better ways, characterize the practices used in teaching, of course. Yeah. And you had noted, you had suggested that we go to the website. Oh, okay. yes. So, so this is this teaching practices inventory. And so this is something, this is a, a, a survey, if you like, that faculty can go through. And it checks off there are 64 items, which sounds like a whole lot, but we put in lots of work making it very simple, clear, objective judgments. This is it done or not done. And, uh, and so one can just quickly go through that and fill this and check these out. And it gives you this then de a very detailed, extensive picture of what kind of teaching practices they're using in all aspects of the class, OK? And so, uh, yeah, so if you, if you go to this website, it explains it, but it also gives you the survey. You can just go in and fill it out yourself, and you'll see exactly what it looks like. Okay. Thank you. Maybe one last question. Yeah. Um, what do uh, presentations and teaching assistants fit into all of this? Are they significantly affected by the fact I, I missed the first part. Teaching assistants and what? Presentations, for instance. Yeah. Problem solving sessions. Right. Uh, do those transform in your experience at UBC, or? So, yeah, so they're included in this, and peop different people include them in different ways. I mean, at Stanford, we've come to the conclusion that it just doesn't make sense to have this separate recitation section, because you want them to be thinking, solving problems, and all of these. And so, so we've just kind of made the, we've, we've made all the, court, all the class meetings equivalent, uh, the teaching assistants often come some of the teaching assistants come and then just ha or act as assistants in the in the classes they were running around, you know, as they're working on it, especially in the bigger classes. The teaching assistants are, are wandering around as as kind of junior coaches in that. And then some of them they just take over 
you know, one of the three class meetings a day, uh, a, a week, but it's in much the same style. Uh, and at UBC, that's usually the way it was done also, is that the, the recitation sections are doing very similar kinds of things, uh, and, uh, but it's being, those are being run by the teaching assistants, not by the instructor. Uh, in all of these things, you have to have the teaching assistants properly trained, because uh, they won't know how to teach this way uh, without help and guidance. And so uh, that was one of the things that all the UBC departments, many of them already were training their teaching assistants, but the others who weren't realized, no, we got to start training our teaching assistants uh, and set up programs to do that uh, so that they knew how to support this kind of teaching properly. So. Okay, I want to remind everyone that there's a reception uh, immediately following, and there are uh, there's food and, and drinks just outside. So speak with uh, Alana further, or, or especially speak with your colleagues about what they're doing in their classes and what you're planning to do in yours. So let's give Carl uh, a round of applause.